There you oh, go. Right. <laughs> Paul, delighted to have you with us today. Um, it, uh, I'm going to go straight into the compliments. Um, it's, it's a great, genuinely, it's great to have you on to have a conversation because you're one of the people who I always think about when I think about people who have given it everything in terms of their commitment and their attention to detail and preparation. And I was lucky enough to have a lots of really positive conversations with you. This is going to be slightly different. We're not going to go into the detail of performance, nutrition, and what we would have talked about week to week. It's more about how you've adapted to life after sport and 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 what we feel is important to communicate to the wider world men women but particular people who maybe have families and who struggle to prioritize a healthy lifestyle but um maybe for the the team here and people who are are watching at home maybe you can do your own little introduction first yeah, thanks, Daniel. I uh, always good to good to chat. I know we, we would always um I say I probably challenged you a decent bit when we were working together and equally you challenged me. So and still 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 having good discussions about this type of stuff. But um so yeah, like I played for, for Dublin um for Dublin footballers from since two thousand and seven, would have played underage before that. Um and but it was in two thousand seven I made my breakthrough year. Um, when I say made my breakthrough year, I, I got onto the panel. Everything is 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 a is a growth process, and um was delighted to be a part of it for two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Kind of made my my debut in the championship, uh, and then it kind of it, it kind of grew from there. And like my season or my career is probably there was kind of two halves to it. Really, the first half was probably re really about me kind of growing and trying to get up to that level. Uh, adapting you know if you knew what i was eating um around them times you, you, you geez things have learned I, I learned along the way as much uh, um, as anybody um and how i was preparing was, was entirely different but you just have to learn these things um but anyway the first couple of years we were you know we would have won a couple of leinster titles which wasn't to be sniffed at and i was certainly very grateful for them at the time um, but we weren't able to make that big breakthrough onto the All Ireland scene. We would have fallen short a number of quarter finals, semi finals, uh, up until two thousand eleven. Um, and two thousand eleven, obviously, we, we, Dublin won their first All Ireland in sixteen years, and I was a part of that panel playing wing forwards. Um, two thousand twelve, um, we we just came up shy against Mayo at thirteen, and we we won it again. And uh, fourteen, we came up shy against Donegal. And then 15, 16, 17, uh, and, and 18 then, um, I was part of the panel that was four in a row. Um, um, within that four-year period of 15 to 18, I had two surgeries, one on my groin, which was an ongoing chronic injury, and uh, one on my back, I had a lumbar spine disectomy in 2018. Uh, I think it was, yeah, 2018. Um, and it took me four months to get back and I got back onto the pitch just for the latter end of 2018. Um, but it was creaking. And in 19, I came back. I you know got myself into probably the best shape I'd been ever in and uh, coming into 2019 from a body composition point of view. Um, typically would have been, Daniel will testify to this, probably was always around 11.5%. And and I I remember we, we would have went to the same DEXA scanner, so they would have get printed us off our reports from the previous scans, and they were always hovering around the elevens. And I in nine I just went the hell for letter out. I got it down to I can't recall was it like did I get was it nine percent or was it eight point well, anyway it was in around it was nine percent yeah yeah so it was but anyway the point was I got myself back into a great great physical condition, but just couldn't keep up. The repeated sprint ability that my position required because of you know a lot of the chronic stuff that was ha happening, in particular the back, and um had a tough call to make, yeah. And I suppose what I needed to do to get myself back into the team was to train harder, push the body, you know, harder than I'd ever done before. And I couldn't do it, you know. Um, and probably psychologically couldn't do it as much as physically as well. You know, mm -hmm. I'd gone to the well so many times, I was 33 um years of age. And yeah, it just kind of felt right. So anyway, I, I bowed out. And um, since then, being competitive still with the club, which just dials the, the tempo back a little bit, but I was mm. able to still play. Um, and only up until this year now, I've been kind of injury free, but this year the back is creaking again. So 
Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of where where my that's probably in a nutshell my my career. Um, that that's the fastest summary of a football career I've ever got. Um, thank you. There's a lot more to it, uh, and we will touch on it. I absolutely do want to touch on it, but I have actually actually have never asked you what within your own home and within a younger Paul Flynn what type of influences were there from a lifestyle perspective and you know were did you cook as a teenager you know was was food on your radar as a young athlete oh my god um i'm the youngest of eight right and um six sisters and one brother and um unashamedly i was molly coddled to a certain degree uh, especially by Mammy Flynn. Um, so to think of me cooking as a teenager, I I I think she 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 probably would have beat me out of the kitchen in fear really? of what might have happened. Um, yeah. Uh, but she really minded me to be fair now. And um and then I'd also got fairly uh supportive sisters there. So no is the answer to that question. Fair uh but however. Um I'm fairly fairly good now, dab hand and you know, partly then um not blown smoke, but like a lot got to do, you know, the influence you have and you had on us as as a team, not just in like, you know, probably guiding us to what kind of foods you should be eating, the information around your macros, you know, um, dialing things specifically for you as an individual, but also that appreciation for food and appreciation for, 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 for preparing your own food and the process of it and understanding it that bit more. And I don't think that's something that's probably left me now you know that like you know um and i'm lucky too fiona my wife um she would play for the dublin senior ladies as well for a number of years so she gets it you know and um and we both kind of to the, to, to the, with the best way in the world we both try to keep you know preparing and, and uh having good good eating habits what because this is really important to us as a as a team so we're in a bit of a bubble uh, around how we feel about the value of food and you've expressed it really well do you think you could give us any kind of insight to how that grew or how that evolved because you know if we think about our world it's linked so closely to body composition and it's not that there isn't that that, that isn't important and that there isn't a really important aspect of that but you've expressed it in a slightly different way how did that develop for you um, I guess, um, uh, education probably, Daniel. Like, you know, I suppose you don't know what you don't know, right? And, um, like, I would have always thought I, you know, even in my early stages of my career, when I, like, okay, it's okay looking back now and saying I wasn't eating as well as I was, was at the latter end of my career, but I felt I was eating really well, you know. Um, I would have woke up every day, I would have had, you know, easily had six weed bix you know, and, uh, I would have probably had, you know, brown bread sandwiches at lunchtime. And, I, you know, so I would have been eating like eating things like um, Nutri-Grain bars. And, you know, at the time I was thinking these are what I need to be eating. I would have been drinking Lucasades. And, you know, you, you back then I felt, right, I'm doing the right things. And that's important, too, when it comes to nutrition. Right. If you think you're doing the right things, it gives you that fuels, that confidence inside you that you're your body is prepared. It's just a placebo effect as much as anything else. And when I was that young and training and playing on multiple teams and training as hard as I, I was, you know, calorie intake was just the most important thing. You know, I was going to burn it off, you know, and I was probably genetically lucky enough too that like that was never a concern. Um, But I suppose then I got kind of, in, when I got into my career and we started weighing the, weighing in and weighing out and that, that kind of you know that definitely makes a difference because i would have been kind of i we had a good few debates about this daniel in relation to as i was getting older in my career um and probably not performing to the level that i wanted to you know you're trying to find okay what kind of things can i do what levers can i pull and i have a big challenges with you about i want to get down you know i want to get my body weight down to 88 kg i was at 90 because I want to shed this 2kg because I don't want to carry this around the pitch, you know. So I think I'm going on a bit, but the point You're I'm not. making is this education, is, really important. education mm. is critical, you know, mm. and just being open-minded to keep on learning. And, you know, if someone's doing something, asking, well, why are you doing that? You know, and what impact is that going to have? 
Um, what happens if I do dial back the weight to 88? But I get, you know, and then you're saying, okay, well, you know, it's okay if you dial back maybe a bit of lean fat or, or a bit of um fast mass, but you don't want to be dialing back on your muscle mass. And you know, I just I guess, yeah, it's down to education. You have to be open minded and you know, be be up for learning um as you as you go along on the journey. What do you think? Uh, you know, we we did. We had lots of debates, and I think that that's really healthy and that's really important. W- what do you think about you know your detail and your mindset towards your your preparation? Like when you think about it now, do you think it was mostly positive? You know, w- what were the positive things that came from that curiosity? Because I mean, that's a key attribute to have as an athlete for for that growth and development. Was it mostly positive? Was what mostly positive? Sorry, Daniel. That curiosity, that debate that we used to have, like even you looking, I would have strongly encouraged you to look in other places, you know, uh, and to ensure that you were fueled in order to train. So it didn't compromise your immunity. It didn't increase the risk of injury, that you didn't creak more under the demands, that your body was fueled in order to do those demands. If you're in a calorie deficit, that puts you at greater risk. So there's a sweet spot uh, between your curiosity and your drive in one way and us, I suppose, having the relationship in order to have some type of a compromise in what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, like the the, the intent was probably always positive, I suppose. Um, like I was always, it was always, it was always a one goal to, to, um, to improve the performances on the pitch, right? And um i tried loads of different things uh even i'm not even sure wh- it, whether you gave me the green light or not i i definitely tried a few bits like you know the intermittent fasting at times um would have tried that um would have tried like you know caffeine and the, in, adding that you know um uh beetroot um shots. yeah every look whatever <laughs> whatever like i was always interested and maybe that was a good conversation with this about pushing the boundaries you know and what kind of nutritional, you know, add-ons can help me to mm-hmm. go faster, go longer, um, get leaner, get stronger, mm-hmm. you know, so that like, you know, and you, then you have to just, it, there's no one size fits all with these things. Like we would have had guys who were taking creatine and not something that I ever did. Funny enough, just didn't think that it was something that I, I needed. Um, rightly or wrongly it was just in my head like i just i didn't want to build up i wanted to stay lean um um so you just have to yeah the curiosity is important but then you just have to understand when to do it why you're doing it and be okay to like that some don't work like so for example caffeine you know um comes with a warning you know i remember going into some games and i like was you know ready to run through a, a wall um because of the amount of caffeine that i've ta- that i t- that I'd taken um, but I couldn't compose myself on the ball. I was like a madman running around trying to get the ball back and then I get it and I was like too hyped up. So I dialed that back or you just take it less or you take, you know, so you have to understand your own body and your own, you know, tolerance to these different, you know. Um, you you know, came in so- at half time like a bull and you said, that's the last time I'm okay taking caffeine again. That's it. <laughs> yeah, look, that, but but you know what? Like it, it it's not fair to say that because... I could have just been hyped up over other things that were going on in my life, but you blame something and that got the blame on that day. You know, that kind of way I have yeah. taken it. I've taken it since and, you know, I'm okay now with it, but you just don't mm. understand how to take it and, you know, um, and maybe making sure that you take it for like two or three training sessions before you go into a big game and take it, you know, because that would be, you know, crazy just to try something new just the day before a game or the day of a game. So, um, but like everyone, I can't stress how everyone's different, like, you know, and that's the, you know, it's, it is no, like people say, oh, can you, can you come and talk to me about nutrition? I'm like, when well, one, I'm not qualified to, but like two, everyone is different, you know, and mm-hmm. you have to understand yourself first and your own, you know, your own needs and what you're trying to achieve. And then, um, and then, you know, what suits your own, your own body. No, it's, it's uh, what we're talking about is years of experience we're talking about trial and error we're talking about lots of different conversations and it's about i mean for for me there's a really important part in that 
you're curious and you're looking for improvement and you have to trust me as a practitioner to to support you and to find the best ways to to achieve those things what uh, i i don't know how you're going to respond to this question but i'm really interested in your answer in in whatever way that you can share and uh, and that is around the relationship that you had with food and body composition because you know as an athlete you want to be lean and you want at the same time to be incredibly energized like it is really hard mentally to figure out exactly how to get that sweet spot you know and that's something that we're seeing a lot of people struggling with even their relationship with food and that was why at the earlier part of the conversation when you talked about the value of food and how you didn't go into you didn't go talk about the the way that food food makes you feel but that's such an important aspect of this people having a positive relationship with food would you is there anything that you could feel like you'd express on your journey around that as an athlete? Um, I always found it harder to um, improve my body composition um, while I was trying to perform. You know, I felt that because there's, yeah, like I'd be paranoid about not being fueled up to perform to a certain degree that I wouldn't risk, you know, um, skipping meals or dialing back on the body composition and some guys did and they were okay with it but I always just got a bit paranoid that I just wasn't going to have that bit, a bit of energy um, and um, I just still wonder about that like you know I, I, I even thinking back I thought I think back a lot about this but now that you say I, I still wonder like would I would you know I'd love to have done what I did in 2019 in relation to getting down to 9%, I would have loved to do that a couple of years earlier to see what would have actually happened, you know, um, because I just, re- just I do recall a, a patch of that 19 before, I kind of got too hectic, that I was feeling very light on my feet. I was in a January, like, you know, winning sprints, winning runs that I probably wouldn't have been doing a couple of years earlier. And now, as I said, the injuries were not allowing me to keep it going, but... I just do wonder about that, Daniel. I still challenge you about that because you, you know, um, you know, it is important to be fueled up. But I, I still think that getting yourself down to your lowest possible body composition that you know suits you is, um, is is only beneficial. That's you, my un, uneducated view on it. Um, you've you've said something very important though. You've identified a period of time, and this is the this is the challenge, uh, particularly in GAA with uh, the off season for most teams being so long and it will depend then on the success of your club but you got yourself into the best possible shape in the off season when it is the time to do it so in professional sports sorry it's off season coming into the preseason you came in flying and that's very very different than trying to do that at, at a point in the year where your body is under the most physical stress and physical demands, which are games. So, you know, absolutely, if you had tried to achieve that or do that much earlier, but that's a very, very hard thing to do when you're you're still winning. You know, you're still at a point where you went through the most successful period and you need your mental break too. You know, mm-hmm. you can't have that off. <laughs> There was Jamaica and there was so that, you know, there was all of these trips that you still have to go away and enjoy those. Uh, and the way but, I did it too was different. Like I would have always assumed that I had to run to get myself into that shape. And I actually did it through doing four gym sessions a week and not running at all. And, um, um, and changing the stimulus to a certain degree, it like where, um got a personal trainer and me and um two others we just did personal training like you know for for three sessions and then our own session and it made the difference like it kind of did exercise i never usually do and did an hour long intense gym session you know literally barely able to move the next day and that 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 like anyway so it was changing the stimulus probably helped that too and i did balance up the macros you know i got the um, um, you know, got myself into a calorie deficit, which you know, I like. I I think the 
I always remember I, like I when I was in college, I did PE in biology, and I always remember getting the presentation. Actually, Niall Moina, and uh, Niall, you know well, and he he's not a specialist. I don't think in nutrition. You might tell me I'm wrong. No, he's, he's not. Actually, but something resonated with me in the presentation that he did, right? And it was just the balance of if you have to be, it's you have to be in a calorie deficit to to lose weight, you know. And like I think that's the it's the, it's it's the key thing, you know, and like that you have to understand, you know, you can do whatever kind of diet that you wish, you know, but if it, it understanding calorie deficit is, is key. And that's why you learn enough, you know, learn what you do too. And, but it's harder to do when you're in season, but in an off season, you can really get into that. Mm-hmm. Before I move on to the next uh, phase, of the conversation, because I, I want to move on to, I want to move on to what I'm I think can really help people and that is that is that transition. Just want to put it back to the to the team. Is there anything in this in listening to this that um that you want to ask Paul or you want to comment on? Because myself and Eva, I'm not uh, not pointing this to you, Eva in, in particular, but myself and Eva were only talking about the value of the work done in the off season. And culturally in the GAA off season is off season. Whereas I remember um, uh, you and also Connor Callahan was another athlete, but I remember between September and November dropped two kilos of fat mass gain, three kilos of muscle mass, five kilo shift. You know, I, I can, I can, I can think of countless athletes who made those type of changes, but just to the team, is there anything you want to mention? I suppose just a question for me, Paul, is like year on year coming in from winning all Ireland, from winning all Ireland, what was kind of in your head is um for you to think, right, how can I be better the next year? Or would you have found that even maybe teammates around you were just happy enough at where they were? Or what kind of really pushed you on to think of, right, what can I do better this year to progress myself as a player or even I I don't know if I've worded that right, quite right, but it's really like for your own self-development each year, what was really kind of your main driver? Yeah, good question. Um, Eva, I there was two probably if um just thinking off the top of my head. One would have been my own pretty hard on myself, always pretty hard on myself, and always, you know, looking at my game at the end of a season saying, okay, even if it was a good year, even if you know things had gone well. I still have. I still was, would all, often see things through the areas where I could improve more than the things that went well, and it was just it, you know, to, to nearly to the level that you don't really enjoy the journey as much because you're always critiquing yourself. I was probably my number one critic, um, and I went with that's the same with a game. You know, you might come off a game, you might you know, kick a few points, but I'd be just cringing that night about, you know, whether I'd be dropping the ball or missing the pass or missing the tackle or, you know. So that kind of carried into the off season too, absolutely. And you'd always be, and, and that led, led into then the second part, which is it would lead you to the to a stage where you'd be like, okay, well, this guy or, or that guy is going to take my jersey. And we were, you know, in, in, the, in the squad that we had, that was very plausible. Like definitely would have happened if I didn't up my game. You know, if you stood still, someone would have overtaken you because there was not a big gap between, you know, um the number one person in a certain position and even the number three person. Like there was, and someone could just slot in. So between my own being hard on myself, um, and just you know trying to get that get better every year, um, and also then the fact that if I didn't, you know, someone else could take my jersey. That was. They are probably the two main drivers, even. Very good. I think even from what working with other teams, you might find that people might come complacent if they they feel that they have their place on the team. So I think having people around you that are always pushing you in in a positive direction is is really beneficial for for you, but actually the whole team. Agreed. Can't come complacent. <laughs> We used to have a line because uh, Jim Gavin was, um, he always used to refer to the aviation industry because it's what he would have like known and been very passionate about. And it's a bit extreme, right? But it's it's uh, in his world, it, it obviously he, he works in airline uh, compliance and reg- that regulatory space. And I think in, t- in pilot's terms, complacency leads to debt. <laughs> 
and it would have been you know uh, something that always struck me um, very very extreme um, not as relevant but the idea of it is, is the same is that like you know if you become complacent you know you're not going to perform to the levels that you should and you're not going to grow an idea grow mindset you have to keep kind of challenging yourself taking yourself out of your comfort zone and and layering on otherwise you know um people will overtake you you know so um a bit of an extreme quote but it, it does it just resonates with you, the importance of not being complacent essentially did you find it that as the years went on that you were able to nearly analyze what needed to you know you talked about uh, self-criticizing and um I suppose there's things within that and the drivers that, that make you want to be better, but then there's becoming effective in terms of your ability to to do better and perform better. Did you find like over the years that you were able to refine your process? I wish I could say yes to that, Gemma. Um but I'd say no to it. Uh, I didn't. Um, I probably only know that now since I've come out of it and kind of got a bit of perspective on football and life and performance. Um, and I guess my probably issue was that I overthought a lot of them things and which I think is so common in athletes like that, you know, the more you learn, the more you kind of try to layer and, that can then cause you to just overthink things or it can cause you to do too much. And even like for take nutrition, for example, like um, if you spend a load of time thinking about it, talking about it, preparing for it, it can just sometimes add to what's already overwhelming being an athlete with the psychology, with the physical elements of it, with, you know, the technical elements of it. Like, and, you know, I probably did more shooting practice when I was getting older. I think I needed to sharpen it up. I reckon now I need to do less of it, you know. So, I I think with the with the perspective now, my whole career, I'd say the key to my probably purple patch in my career was just keeping it simple, you know. And okay, you didn't not do the work, you know, but you just didn't overthink it. You just kind of went out and let it be, you know. And I think all the studies would probably suggest that. You get into the zone that bit easier, yeah, and more often when you're when you're just not thinking, you know. And I'd say my issue at the end of my career was I overthought things to a certain degree, Gemma. So I think that can be kind of double edged sword. Um, and now I'm back in the club, and I know it's a different level, now it's a different standard, and you know, but you just I mean, you know don't think about it at all, and you know, you know, you just the things that, like for example, shooting, you know, it, they, they, you know, it's 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 way better because I'm not even practicing. I'm not really thinking about it because I know how to do it and you're just calm and you're just present, I suppose. So sorry, Gem, if that's not the answer that you, you no, know, that's I, a... I wish I wish for me it was too, because I probably would, you know, would have got more on my um individual performances, like especially at the latter end. So I think I'd say that's common enough, right? You know, um, but you know, maybe not. No, it's a brilliant answer. I love listening to this, Paul. Um <clears throat> It's so good. It's it's uh it's brought me right back into the dressing room. C- can I ask you? Uh, I I'm 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 so fascinated with people's own different types of preparation, and I have absolutely no problem saying I learned an awful lot from being in that dressing room, and I I learned so much from being around you. And one of the things that was so obvious to me was you know while you're saying there that uh you may have overthought things there was an energy that you gave off and there's a positivity that you give off that was really infectious were you always like that you know and i'm talking about the way that on all ireland day you could be dancing around the dressing room to music you know were you always that person or did you evolve into that person um I'd say that part's natural enough, you know. That's probably the 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 giddiness in me. Um um so that is natural, you know. That's not like something that would have evolved around that's just who I am, you know. Um 
So, and there's a little bit of that as nervous tension too, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's adrenaline in the body and, you know, it's probably a little bit overzealous because of that, but not saying I overthought this too, but you'd be trying to let that steam off by just being lighthearted and, you know, having fun and trying to enjoy it that bit more. Um, Cause that's so important, you know, and, you know, I always think of Jack McCaffrey walking around and the, in the parade, you know, for a guy, he's smiling his head off, looking into the crowd. And I, you know, I didn't smile my head off looking into the crowd, but I did do that. I did look into the crowd with a kind of internal smile anyway, as if to say, you know, like, look what we're at here. Like, it's, it's pretty cool, you know, and sometimes you just don't actually just take that few seconds to do it. Um, So, yeah, and they're kind of like the things I miss, Daniel, funny enough, like, is that kind of, that energy around game day, you know, very hard to recreate that whatever you do, you know, like, um, I, it's actually impossible. I was on, I'm only, I was only a staff member, you know, and I, I don't mean only a staff member, but I've played the game and that is the closest I've ever come to playing the game. That's, that's the closest. It is being a part of something and being in a dress room where the energy felt like that where it was simply electric and so positive and not everybody was doing, everybody could do their own thing. And I just thought that the freedom that there was in the dress room for you to behave like that. And for me to feel impacted and to be allowed to feel impacted by it. I, I, I think it was very, I mean, we know it was, it was really special, but I, I think that understanding the, knowing that that's the right thing for you before a big game is, is so important. And I, spent so much of my time. The reason I'm bringing it up is I spent so much of my playing career being too serious. You know, it it being and, and thinking that that was the way that it should be. And I felt like that was such an enlightenment. Um, well, it is, that is the right thing sometimes for, for some people. Like, you know, that's the thing about it. This is no different than anything. You have to figure out what's the right thing for you to do some people mm. need to be serious some people need mm. to sit in the corner looking at their notes to say okay mm. here's my kpis here's the opposition analysis you know so it's mm. all about understanding your your own what makes you tick a hundred percent but what i'm saying is i it it was too late and i just wish i could have had way more crack and way more fun and that that's what would have allowed me to perform better uh, we had a conversation uh only a couple of days ago and I have really got into the mindset of, of strike on these notes when they feel really strong and you feel really strongly about them. But we had a conversation just organically about the, the changes that occur uh, in, in, in the body as we age and there's mental and physical adjustments. It's not a, you, you, how will I put this? You are still a high performing athlete. You are still playing football at a, at a high level and you've got a structure in your life. But for me, I suppose I, I, I don't have that dealing with certain injuries and things like that. And it's been a, it's been a big transition. How have you, uh, how have you found that transition? First, yeah, correct you. I'm definitely not a performing athlete anymore. Uh, which <laughs> that's that's definitely I play, you know. Um, I train, you know, but like, like everybody, you know, well, a lot of people train, you know, and definitely the higher levels than I do currently. Um, so, um, but look, what are I'm you doing? Trying, I'm still trying to take away playing playing with the club, but it's it's been very frustrating for me this season. The back is just it's it's creaking again and just causing you know sciatica down both legs you know which is which i've pulled like i well, have aggravated a tendon at the back of my knee on four occasions already this year um last night being one of them which is entirely frustrating coming up to the championship um but it's so i can't do the same type of training that i would have always done so that's really frustrating and what's then what's what's happening as a as a, as a result of that is that my body composition and my 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 body is changing, you know. And part of that is because now I'm 37 years of age and I'm not training as hard. The load is lower, um, and I'm probably not eating as well. I'll be straight up, like you know, um, three kids, you know. Um, fortunately, I don't have the luxury of just waking up now in the morning and saying the one thing that I need to look after is what I eat for the rest of the day. It's kind of like the maybe last thing that comes on my mind, which is 
which is frustrating because I like that's the problem when you know things too. Like I know the answer to not every answer to the administration, but I have a good idea of what works for me, right? And I I'm not I haven't got the time to actually do it. Like me and Fiona are only chatting about it, my wife, and we we're just saying like she she knows too, and we're like, okay, let's just get it this week, and then you know life just gets in the way. You know, three kids get um uh, come first, and always will. You know, um, but. It would be, you know, yeah, but we will immerse ourselves back in it. Um, but anyway, like, yeah, so what's changed mainly, Daniel, and which is what we had a good conversation about was like around like my, you know, my glutes, ties, legs. Um, that's been the main change, right? Where like when you're training, especially like, you know, in Gaelic football, um, the, there, that's what takes the majority of the load. You're doing like mass runs, you're doing, like every training session with Dublin like would have been h harder I would have worked harder in them training sessions than I probably work in a, in a, in a club game now um, and that's partly because of different things out of my body but it's just a fact and it, um, we used to train like you know so you're getting such a load such a hit on those main muscles and you know you're going to train a half an hour earlier you're doing glute band work prehab work you, the days off or not days off you're doing so you know, the load has just decreased. And I argue probably the calories have not been as good. And I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, you know, if I'm on, if, if, if I'm, um, yeah, what the calorie deficit surplus balance is, we don't measure it. So you throw all those things into the mix, then every month, every, you know, couple of months, it just gets a little bit worse or it just changes. Maybe not to say it gets a bit worse because it's probably, you know, but it, just, it does, your body changes. And uh, it's kind of, it's, it's frustrating, you know, um, because you, you, as I say, you kind of know the, like what you need to do, but you can't always carry about the time to do it. So look, I'm, yeah. So that's kind of, that's been part of the transition, which I found quite difficult. And I know I spoke to a lot of lads about this. And even when I was in the GPA, like there's global studies on this, like guys, struggle with career transition for a number of different reasons you know some guys miss that buzz that we chatted about in relation to the game day some guys miss just the camaraderie of the dressing room because they just don't get it they don't go to a club and play i still have that uh some guys miss just the, the idea of you know you wake up every morning you've got this challenge ahead of you to be better that continuous journey of growth um and some guys in more american football and rugby for actually whereby they're uh, one of the hardest things in career transition is their body composition just changes because they're a big, huge unit and they have to be for their role. And then they're not feeling that anymore. And then they end up like their body composition changes. So, so it is like probably unspoken, Daniel, to be honest with you, it's not something that a lot of lads will be out talking about, but uh, definitely there are lads who are experiencing it, you know? And, uh, and I think there's a gap, like, you know, even for ye guys, you know, to, to help people like that, because, um, there are, and you know, need, need, you need you need to spoon feed it because it's it. You just want to know the answer. You you haven't got time to research, or you haven't got you know. You just you kind of need to make it pretty um straightforward. So and then you have to be consistent and disciplined. And when you're not in a high performance culture or arena, it's easy not to be consistent. You might do a piecemeal. So um, there was something there, there, but it's no, just, no, yeah. it is great, absolutely great. That, that there's great quality in that, and I think it sets us up to talk more and to go into it a little bit more, just a tiny little bit more. Don't worry, we won't, we won't do it all evening. But uh, I want to know: Do you remember what you said to me around the mindset of transition when we played that game of golf? And um, we, I was, we were talking about that. We the, the training element came up. And you brought something up around identity. Do you remember what you told me? Uh, go on. Uh, remind me. It was in the context of how we view ourselves. And uh, that as an athlete, it's recognizing that it's these key behaviors that give us that that give us a sense of confidence and that have a huge element uh, in building our self-esteem. And that in order to maintain a certain level of confidence and a certain level of that uh, uh, self-esteem, that physicality and our physical presence is something that we need to continue to invest in. And you're not, uh, while you have uh, some of a, a science background, I, it, it, I never forgot it. And I think about it so much. And it is about recognizing 
that you do need to reframe a different type of identity for yourself. You are, I am a father. We have different priorities. We have a different type of routine. We have different time. We cannot be, we'll stick to the, the to you for a moment. We can't be Paul Flynn that lived this life. We, we, we That time isn't there. So it's accepting our circumstances and adjusting our, our habits and our routines. And I suppose the next part of it is, what have you carried through? Because there are things that you've carried through, you've already referred to. What can people continue to carry through that's positive from what they know is effective? Um, what can they carry through? Um, it's a, it's like, it's, it's a tough question, right? Because it's not, you know, one thing. I think you have to take bits of everything. Um, it's a bit of a forge of an answer. But like, for example... Um, like I understand, I understand the importance of gym, right? And if I can't do anything in a week, if I only have two days, you know, and if I would rather lift twice, um, and do two really good gym sessions rather than go for two runs. And even though sometimes time doesn't allow me, I have to just go for a run because like a run for me is kids are down. Okay, Fiona, I'll be back in twenty five minutes, and I go for a five k, run around the block, come back boom, you're back in the house. You go to gym, best way in the world, it's an hour and a half, right? So, but still, it's so important because the body composition, you know, you, you can keep your body composition in decent enough shape if you do two to three gym sessions a week. You know, the two actually, if you did two gym sessions a week, you'd maintain it. If you did three good gym sessions a week, well, I, I suppose again, I have to relate it back to me. If I did three good gym, if I did three gym sessions for three weeks on the trot, I'm pretty back, I'm pretty much back to where I'm happy again or I'm content again, you know? Um, Hallelujah. I'm just, I didn't uh, know if you give that answer, but this is, you've talked about how it is a combination of so many things. It's a combination of mindset. It's a combination of the, the gym. You have components of, you know, what works from a nutrition point of view. But what you just described is you were able to prioritize you know, you're able to recognize, hang on a second. I know that maintaining strength as a, as a key a facet of me as a person is a huge variable and I can get fitness back or I can do a running session or something further down the line, but getting that gym session is, is absolutely fundamental. Now there's something else that you've just touched on that I think is really important and that is that you said, okay, three, four weeks of consistency in the gym, but ultimately you haven't let the whole thing go. You know, you've still maintained a level of structure and you haven't let uh, all of your habits, even as a parent, slide. Isn't that fair to say? Listen, I think I'm, um, it's very fair to say. <clears throat> and one of the things that like, even when we have twins, they were three and then I've um, a 20 month old. So like, we're in the, the teeth of it, you know, like it's pretty full on, like, you know, and it's great. Um, but we both made a commitment, me and Fiona, like, you know, not not we didn't write this down or anything like that, but it's just a loose enough commitment that we value exercise and we see it as something that's important for our kids to see us going. So, you know, they know we bring them down to the side of the football pitch all the time. They're staring, the twins in particular, starting to get understand what that means and they kick the ball around and all that um but even just to know like that like you know we nearly alternated like at the moment she's training monday wednesday i train tuesday thursday and one of us does you know the bedtime or whatever and they now know because we're coming down in our kit and they're saying you're going football daddy you know our mammy and we think that's pretty cool and everyone to their own right but we like that and um the obviously the ideal world would be able to do it after and they're in bed but you can't always when you're playing team sports but like even with the gym, like we will, you know, we, we we carve out time for each other. And that's not the same with all my mates. That's not the same with like everyone I know. Like, you know, that's just something that has to give for them because that's their time. And, you know, so everybody's circumstances are, are completely different, especially when you get to this stage, because it is you have to, you know, looking after the kids is, is number one. But um it helps is what I'm trying to say that we both value exercise and, and how not just it impacts 
like because it has an impact on the family too because we're in better spirits like we're we know if we didn't train for four days in a row like we would not be in good shape like psychologically we'd be getting stressed about the smaller things we'd be maybe you know narky with the kids like you know you know yourself and you're not i don't that's the way I we would be, and I would be. I might speak for myself, I'm not fair on her, but um, I know I need to try and simple as that. It's my outlet. It's something that's part of my identity, uh, regardless of you know the body composition stuff. It's just it's my release, you know. Um, so it's really important. So just go back to that because I just said that that comp that three gym sessions, like, but like if you even if I even ask you, like, so the idea that like. The glutes and the quads and the legs are probably and I'm doing as long as I'm not doing full body sessions, but it's probably important or is it important that I blend both? You know, should I be getting because the the athletic you know nature of of running is obviously important on on um your legs. I'm assuming, but that's just yeah. Really so, so the biggest variable at play here at the moment, and it's amazing we didn't actually get into this detail when you called is that you have a pain pathway at the moment. And when you have pain, you have dysfunction. And when there's dysfunction, you have atrophy. So what happens, and I have exactly, I, I had a double disectomy and I have knee trouble at the moment, to torn cartilage. So if there's pain, it tends to shut down the stimulus to muscle. And if the stimulus isn't there and strength and there's pain, muscle loss occurs. So what happens is that fat mass and the aggregation of fat mass is far more likely. So in injured athletes, uh, retired athletes or athletes who don't maintain the same level of load, the first, like the big muscles are our glutes and our trunk. So through the lower back and through the trunk and through the quads, I would see even athletes where they're back to their full strength, but they're still squatting, deadlifting, whatever it might be until they've got the volume of running and they've got the full volume of the game stimulus and everything. There could be a, still a two kilo deficit, you know, if there's been a, a period where they've been injured or they've been out or it's coming back from an ACL. So the combinations of everything are really important, but it is the awareness. And this is the thing, like I am having this conversation now every week or, and, and, uh, the the TED talk of Brendan Egan has come up even with you and I, people don't recognize the value of maintaining muscle mass and they don't realize the importance of maintaining that stimulus. It's, it's essential for longevity function and life. And what you're talking about really is just, and this is what we have to get into our mindsets. It's just about maintaining what we have. You're not going to be building new levels of lean mass because you're. we are, unfortunately, with age on the decline. We don't have the same hormonal status. We don't produce the same testosterone or growth hormone. We don't recover as quickly. So the message, um, and like even with you, what did I say? We have to measure it. We have to measure it. And we can't be afraid of that measurement. So one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to get you to do an in-body and we're going to at least have a track and time of where are you now this time next year. You want to be as close to that or better if you can. And that's the kind of thing where we, we think about body composition assessment immediately is what body fat am I? And that's why we need to bring in much more awareness about the understanding of muscle mass, muscle mass, currency for health and currency for performance. Uh, anything that the team wants to ask, Paul, I'm uh, we're going to wrap it up in the next minute or two. It's not so much a question, more so just the um, even just an observation of the conversation and the fact that, and the way that you ended it with by by speaking about how important it is to know who you are and your identity and what's important to you, what matters to you, to really know and understand, or to really, I suppose, figure out how to place those important pillars in your life. Um, because ultimately that's where it all stems from. And it's not just a matter of, I suppose, asking someone else what to do or coming to, you know, the likes of us to, to, for the answers. Um, it's whenever you really understand who you are, we are, I suppose, the people that can really help to I suppose from the education point of view, but I think just just the way you spoke about it and the way it all kind of came to the end there, I think it really solidified the importance of that. So I thought that was really interesting. 
Thanks, Shannon. Yeah. Because otherwise you'll just buy in for a period of time and then you'll stop, you know, uh, or you, you do some of the things that are just unnatural and not suiting your lifestyle, not suiting your overall being. And it then is just um your your tip your your typical fad. You know, you might get some really short wins, but it's not sustainable. Um but yeah, you 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 obviously got you guys obviously you guys know that. Uh, oh, go ahead, Eva. <laughs> um, so obviously, when you were playing for Dublin, Paul, a, a huge part of your purpose was training, and and it took up a lot of your time. How did you navigate that change when you had a more extra time then when you stopped playing, and it, I suppose a shift in your purpose? How did you navigate that? Yeah, really, yeah. actually. Unbelievable question, to be honest with you, Aoife. and it's probably something that I'd say if you ask most players, they have, they don't figure that out, they don't think that far ahead, and it's I suppose when you're in that kind of bubble, you're probably spending of your capacity in your head and your body, you're probably spending around eighty percent of your time in 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 camp. That's where your head is at. Like even though you're working, right? You know, you're just you are working, and you're you know, but. You just can't not be so all in, you know. I think in anything in life, if you want to be the best, you really have to be all in, you know. And that's the hardest thing about being an amateur athlete is that you you obviously can't. Um, but like, yeah, you see, so when you're then not in at all, uh, it's really tricky. And I actually thought this is where you were gonna go, Daniel, like in relation to when you're trying to transition out, like what you have to nearly try and do is create a ramp out of the game and not let it be a cliff edge. So, you know, when it's a cliff edge, you, you just fall into the issues that, you know, you, you, you know, you can get involved in things that you shouldn't, you know, like gambling or this happened a lot, you know, when um in global studies in relation to players leaving the game, um, mental health issues creep in and it's fraught with kind of, you know, uh, danger, you know, but if you can create a ramp out of the game, whether it be staying involved in coaching or media, if you can, or, um, you know, like us, we're very lucky in the GA that we can play with our club. They create little mini ramps out of the game, and I think that's important. And it also helps with, like, you know, by maintaining things like your training, your nutrition. They're all part of building little ramps out of the game, and it's the same in anybody in any walk of life. Like it's like when you retire from work when you're um, if you're sixties and you think, oh, it's okay, I'm gonna have all this time. It's not. It's 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 not really. You need to be prepared for it. Like it's part of your. Your, your identity, your purpose. So you have to create these little mini ramps, you know, to help make sure that you don't fall off that cliff edge. So, uh, and I like, and even with the best will in the world, if I didn't nail that, like I had told Daniel this, like, you know, I had a tricky six months, I'd say, maybe longer, where you're doing all these things, but yet you still don't feel like 100%. You're like, I'm not just buzzing. I'm not, I haven't got my mojo. You know, why is that? And then you realize why it is, but you can't bloody get the answer. So to, to leave the game, and this is the same if you're a club player too, or any sport. Sorry, but I just talk about what I kind of know. You you have to prepare for that, and and even when you prepare for it, you can identify and try figure it out. But it will come a time where it's kind of tricky. And this I've spoken to so many past players about this in loads of different sports, and they've all kind of experienced it. Uh, and and you know, and back to what I said earlier on about the things, everyone has to kind of figure it out themselves. But try get as much support as you can from people who've gone through it because they'll help you with it. Thank you, Paul. Eva, did you want to come in there? No, I was just going to say uh, thanks for all of that. It was a really, really good insight even into your playing career, but also that transition. So I think we're all really interested in, in your path and it was really, really good insight. So thanks a million. Thanks, Eva. And what's this on body thing, Daniel, that I'm doing? Actually, that's the first I've heard of that. Is this some... <laughs> He's just dropping a coin. <laughs> oh, yes. Paul loves when I do that. He's like, what the hell was that about? I get a message af afterwards. And he's like, what the hell, in body? What are we doing with that? <laughs> but he will be all for it, particularly when he sees the data. He'll absolutely eat it up. And, and this is what I'm talking about. It's just, it's these little things, Paul. Like for me, I, I, I'm going to turn philosophical and turn back to process that again. Like I feel so privileged to be able to have this conversation with my team and you, you're, you, you are just such an incredible ambassador as an athlete and you, you've got such a great mindset and it's great to be able to share it with my world and it will help so many people. Um, so I feel very fortunate, very grateful. 
but it's just back to the process and what you carry through is the is is an element of monitoring your body in a different way like for me it can be bloods it can be getting your cholesterol checked it can be you know I got my colonoscopy done. It can be dental hygiene. It can be just using the values around health to make sure that your body is in, the, in is in a good place. So in body is a very simple way of looking. It's like if it's like um just a slightly less accurate a way of measuring body composition compared to a DEXA. It's within about two percent. So uh, it's much more accessible and it gives you that feedback. I hope the two percent is. Like downwards, uh, downwards, <laughs> yeah. downwards. <laughs> it actually is so um and particularly suits people who have got high levels of muscle mass so you'll be probably very happy with your results it'd be great for your confidence <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. um well, listen, thank, thank you, you very much for that I, I, that was that was great really 